Good morning, Johnson Ferry. Are we doing okay today? Well, it is great to see you. I'm glad that at least 20 of you are excited to be here, and that's great. But it is a great day. We've all already had an incredible day of worship at our first hour, and today has been, uh, this service has been no different. want to welcome those of you watching at home. I know we got folks all over the world watching. We'd love to know where you're watching from today. Just simply put it in the chat room. And also want to say hey to our students who are watching uh, through a student watch party this morning. So grateful for you. Now, in just a little bit, we're going to jump into the text, uh, the Bible, which is Luke chapter 14. Of course, want to mention that there's a big game tonight, right? Big game tonight. Anybody know? Uh, now, I know, I know everyone's nervous. They're thinking, oh, bless his heart, new pastor. He doesn't know how we do sports here in Atlanta. Well, uh, you may think I'm delusional as I just envision next Sunday this room being filled with people wearing Braves gear and jerseys and T-shirts, and I, I see it in my mind's eye, and if you think I'm delusional, don't worry. I'm a, I'm a gamecock. We live in the land of delusional, so uh, I can't wait to see that hopefully next Sunday. They say there are three things you should not talk about at a dinner conversation. Religion, politics, and money. Today we're going to talk about all three. A little less so politics, but certainly religion and money and where those two things come together. In this series that we've called Hot Takes, where we have taken a selected number of teachings from Jesus that have some impact on the current conversation happening in our world today. We tend to think we're the first group of people that have been at odds with one another as a culture, but certainly as you look at history, that is not the case. Even Jesus, I'm sure even Jesus amongst his own followers had debate about politics. We know that the disciples that followed Jesus had different backgrounds. Think about it. You had a man like Simon the Zealot and also Matthew the tax collector. Zealots wanted to do anything they could to get rid of Roman oppression and authority, Matthew, as a tax collector, was an advocate for Rome as he collected taxes for Rome. It it would have been amazing just to see the debates they would have had around the dinner table. But as we look at the Word of God today, our heart as a church is that in this series, we would allow Jesus' voice to be the loudest in our ears. Not what you read on your social media pages, not what you see on TV, not that those things can't be helpful in some way as we think about and pray about who we vote for, and I hope and pray that you either have voted or will vote in the next few weeks. But what does Jesus have to say to some of these issues? And, and I've been reminded, sometimes through conviction, that I need to make sure that I, I view my politics through the lens of my faith rather than viewing my faith through the lens of politics. Amen? (laughs) And that's the reminder that we need to have as we look at these central texts today. So today we're looking at Luke chapter 14, which is in your New Testament. If you are new to church, you're not a follower of Jesus, you're trying to figure all this out, what we do at this point in the service is we open up the Bible, which we believe is the Word of God, and we ask that God by His Spirit would speak to us through his word. So that's my main job, is to stand up here and to prayerfully and hopefully spirit-filled, in a spirit-filled way, would teach the word of God. So in honor of God's word, let's all stand together. If you're at home and you're den, stand up. We can see you, not really, just kidding. But Luke chapter 14, I'm going to read for us Luke chapter 14, verse 1, all the way through verse 14, as we hear a dinner conversation where Jesus talks about religion, politics, and money. Let's listen in. It happened that when he went to the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. 
And he took hold of him and he healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or neighbors or relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But... When you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Father, as we dive into this text today, I pray that we would have a teachable spirit to listen to what you would have to say to us as we overhear a dinner conversation where issues like pride, humility, even taking care of the poor are featured. Convict, inspire, and help us to live out the mission of Jesus. And we'll pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. I've entitled this message today, Three Questions no one wants to answer. Specifically, we're looking at issues of pride and even delving a little bit into what Jesus says about taking care of the poor. We get a front row seat into the heart of Jesus in this text, and he challenges us. We often tend to gloss over the words of Jesus as pretty little platitudes that help us have a positive outlook on life. But the reality is these are words that cut to the heart and that are convicting if we truly understand what he is saying. Three questions. If you have your note sheet, have brought it with you. If you're at home, there's a link where you can fill out the notes and follow along with us with fill in the blank. Three questions we want to ask ourselves this morning as we look at this text. Let's just dive right into those questions. The first question is this. Do I want to be a servant or to be known as a servant? Do I want to be a servant or to be known as a servant? And there is a difference. Luke here in chapter 14 is giving us this this dinner conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Now, you may not know a lot about the Pharisees, but we tend to think of them as the enemy, the opposition of Jesus. In many cases, they were. But giving them the benefit of the doubt, these were people who were trying to honor God, honor his law. They had come up with a whole series of of oral teachings about the law. Now, the problem was they often went beyond what the law said and added their own interpretation and acted as if it was just as binding as what God had given to Moses. So they were constantly questioning Jesus because he's saying things that, that seemed to differ from what the law said and certainly differed from what their tradition said. But they invite Jesus to a dinner. And it's interesting in verse 1, it says they were watching him. Properly translated, that means they were lurking. I I think this is not just a well-meaning come and have dinner so we can get to know you more, Jesus. This is a trap. And we see that because it says in verse 2 that there was, in fact, it literally says, and behold, there was a man with dropsy in front of Jesus. I didn't know a lot about dropsy. I had to go look it up to see exactly what it was. But it was apparently a disease that attacked the vital organs and it made you retain fluid. So you would 
you would often swell up that was very noticeable. So everyone would know that something was wrong with this man. And we get the idea, given what Jesus later says about inviting the lame to dinner, that this was not a friend of the Pharisees, but he was put there to prove a point because it was the Sabbath day. And their tradition said you can heal on any day you want except for the Sabbath day. So if this man, Jesus, claims to be God, he will not go against our religious tradition. So what does Jesus do? He asks a question, verse 3. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Well, now they're in a pickle. Because they knew that the law said they should love God and love neighbor. They knew that it was appropriate to heal if that was God's will. But they also wanted to honor the Sabbath. So what did they do? Is it, is it okay to heal someone who's in need? Or should we not in, in light of it being the Sabbath? And so what do they do? They say nothing. So Jesus grabs the man, he takes hold of him, pulls him to himself. It says he heals him, and then he sends him away. And then he asks them a question. Let me ask you this. Let's say that you had an ox. Let's say you had a son that fell into a well. Would you rescue him even if it was on the Sabbath? And the implication is that they would obviously and immediately try to do what they could do. Not that they didn't love God, but if their, if their son, if your son fell down a well, even if it's the Sabbath, I, I'm getting down there and getting my son out of the well. How about an ox, which wasn't just a pet, but it was a source of livelihood. We, we don't make a living. We can't plow crops. We can't do the things we do to live without this ox. If that ox gets in that, in that well, and I don't get him out soon, he's going to die. So even if it's the Sabbath, I would heal him. And that's Jesus' point. He's not going against the law or diminishing the Sabbath, but he's saying there's a higher principle, which is God's love for a man who needed rescue and healing, and Jesus does that. Now, he's putting one thing against the other because the Pharisees saw themselves as these great servants of God. But here's the question, and I think about this for my life, and how about for you? Are we really wanting to be servants or are we just wanting to be known as a servant? And there's a difference. The picture we give the Pharisees is that they like to serve as long as other people saw that they were great servants. It's easy to throw them under the bus, but we've all done the same thing. I have. I remember vividly a time I did this. I was in seminary, which is graduate school for those of us who feel called to the ministry, we were living in Dallas, Texas at the time. I was in a class in seminary where they required you to share the gospel of Jesus. There's good news of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection. It was an evangelism class, and you had to share the gospel five times in a semester and write a paper about each time. Nothing motivates evangelism like the guilt of also having to write a paper. Well, the semester was coming near the end, and I still had a couple of papers to write. And fortunately for me, as I'm driving home there on the exit of the, of the highway near the apartment where we live there in Texas, I saw a homeless man sitting there with a sign saying he needs food. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to give this man food and a great opportunity to write my paper. So I, I pulled over. And there was a, a, Whatabur a Whataburger. You know what Whataburgers are? They have them in Texas. And that's, Texas is a great country, by the way. But anyways, um, they have uh, a Whataburger. And so I, I pulled over and I got him, you know, a combo or something, burger and fries, whatever. And I'm, you know, I'm walking out. I, par I parked my car in the parking lot. I'm walking out to the man. He's kind of on the island, you know, where the exit of the highway is. And I'm, I'm I mean, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. This is going to be really nice. And, and I give him the food because his sign says I want food. And can you believe he was not that grateful? In fact, he told me I'd really rather have money than food. I'm thinking, but your sign says food. Now, I, I, I just to be honest, I'm thinking, well, boat, you know, uh, hundreds of other people drove by. They didn't stop. Look at me. I stopped. I mean, you didn't even say thanks. You, you didn't even, you know, I, I, I mean, you don't have to like bow at my feet, but could you at least say thank you? That'd be nice. And he, and he did nothing. And I tried my best to share Jesus with him and, and went on. And I left that encounter feeling a little bit mad at how ungrateful he was. And I think the reason 
It's because I was more concerned about being known as a servant than I was actually being one. Do you want to know one of the best ways to find out if you're a servant or not? It's to see how you respond when you're treated like one. Jesus is confronting the Pharisees. Do you want to be a servant or do you want to be known as a servant? Which gets to the second question, which is very similar, but equally convicting. These get worse, by the way, just so you know. The second question is this, wh- whose applause am I, am I truly living for? I mean, really, wh- whose applause, wh- who do I want to say, you're doing a good job, way to go, whose applause am I truly living for? Let's look at verse 7 through 11. Jesus here at this dinner notices what's happening and he tells a parable. Verse 7 says, He began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table. Now, this is different in our culture than, than, than theirs. He's about to tell a parable of when you go to a wedding. Now, I know at our modern day weddings, for the most part here in America, we will have a, a table at the top of the room that's for the bridal party, or at least the groom and the bride and maybe the best man, the maid of honor. But even, it's interesting, we, we've kind of gotten away from that because we just want everyone to you know, kind of be equal in the room. But in this Jewish culture, where you sat was a really big deal. And Jesus noticed at this dinner party that he went to that, that everyone was jockeying for seats. Who would get the best seat? And so he uses the opportunity to teach a parable, and it begins in verse 8. He says, when you're invited to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and he who you in- invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. What, what is he talking about here? Well, in, in a traditional Jewish setting, you would have a table that might look like a U. You know, a table here, a back table, and a table here. And, and right here in the middle would be the place of honor for the host. And the two most treasured seats in the place would be to his right and to his left in these two chairs. Now just imagine that you get to the dinner early and a lot of people are coming and you want to sit beside whoever the host is and you look up at the table and you notice hey no one is sitting there yet and you go and you you take the seat right here right beside the host imagine how embarrassing it would be for the host to see you and to know that that's not your place and to walk up to you in front of everyone and go ma'am i am i am sorry but this seat is taken in fact, I have a seat for you. It's, it's way at the back. It's way in the bleachers up there. You can't even see the wedding slideshow, but you're way in the back, right? And imagine the embarrassment when you would have to get up and take your bag and in front of everyone, kind of shimmy around the crowd and walk all the way to the back. And Jesus is saying, don't be the kind of person who's always looking at the best seat. In fact, he'll go on in verse 10 to say the opposite, but when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Now, to be fair, you could get to the party early, sit at the back seat, and then just tell everybody how awesome and how humble you are because you sit at the back seat. In fact, you're the, probably the most humble person in the room, you know, if you tell everybody about just how humble you are. You, you see how just sitting there doesn't mean anything because it's about the heart condition. What Jesus is saying is this, but how amazing would it be if you took that last seat way up in the bleachers, way up there. How you doing? Can you wave to me? You doing good back there? I see you guys. Yeah, thank you. Glad you're here. Those are great seats, by the way, aren't they? That's right. Imagine if I walked all the way up to you And I took your hand and said, I have a seat for you up here in front of everybody. Me as the host took your hand and walked you and put you right here at the seat of honor. Everyone here would not say, wow, look how amazing that person was 
who got to come all the way from the back to the front. You know what you'd say? You'd say, how gracious is that host that he would take that person from way back there and give them a seat way up here. The point here is that when we live for the applause of God, we're trusting him to take us from way back there to way up here. That's why it says in verse 11, he says, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. If you want to humble yourself, God then exalts you. If you try to exalt yourself, God will humble you. And this speaks to just the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, where things just don't make sense. Up is down, down is up. And yet that is the way of God. Now you might wonder, now why do we need to hear this? Why is this so relevant? You know why we need to go to this message again and again, especially as followers of Jesus? If you're at home right now, you know why we need to do this again and again and again? It's pretty simple, because most of us don't actually believe this. We think, well, this sounds great in church. I mean, yeah, everyone needs to be humble. It sounds good. But that doesn't work where I work because to climb the ladder, you've got to fight and scratch and claw your way to the top no matter what. Or you think, well, that sounds good and all, but I, I, I've got stress to worry about at work or something's not going my way. I don't have time to trust in God. I got to make this happen. Or we think, if I'm going to get to the big show, if I'm going to play ball in the major leagues or the NFL, I, I, look, this, this sounds good, but, but look, humble people don't make it to the top. And, and this is really an act of us wondering, am I, am I really living for God's applause or the applause of my neighbor or my social media feed or anyone else? There's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with godly ambition. But ultimately, it gets down to whose applause are we living for? Jesus says, the humbled will be exalted. But do we believe it? So these are tough dinner questions. The third dinner question is this one. What have I sent ahead? What have I sent ahead? Ahead. Now, this may seem a little bit out of left field, but this is where we get to, I think, taking care of the poor. Jesus now flips the script a little bit from you being the one who's invited to a party to now, what do you do if you are the one having the party? In verse 12, he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. At first glance, this can confu- seem confusing. Are you saying, Jesus, that if, if let's say that I am a wealthy person, and let's be honest, most of us watching, most of us in the room today, compared to the rest of the world, we are the rich people. But is he saying that if we invite our neighbors or coworkers or family members over to be with us, to do life with us, that we've done something wrong? No, he's not saying that. In fact, if, if you look at the original language, there's an idiom here that is probably better read, uh, do not only invite neighbors, rich people, all that, but also invite, and then he, and then he gives four categories, the lame, the crippled, uh, the blind, and the poor. The one thing that you can't escape in reading the New Testament, reading the message of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, is just how much Jesus said about taking care of the poor. This is where we need to take a quick little aside and to think a little bit about our political situation. You know, it's interesting that in election cycles like this, we tend to debate economic philosophies. In particular, in this election, we're having a lot of conversations about capitalism versus socialism. I do not think the Bible puts forth one integrated, sufficient economic philosophy. If you say, well, no, it it talks about capitalism, in some ways I would say you're right because the Bible does advocate for personal property ownership. That's why it also says you should not steal. 
But we also recognize that capitalism, if unchecked, can lead to greed and taking advantage of people. Someone might say, well, that's why the Bible talks about socialism. Everyone is treated equally. There's an altruistic nature of let's take care of everybody. And, and it is true that the Bible talks about taking care of people, but if you look at the history and the practice of socialism, it's what Francis Schaeffer called Christian heresy because it, it values sharing and caring, but radically ignores sin and the need for a savior, which is why socialism is essentially rooted in anti-God-like behavior that puts the government at the top instead of God, as you look at the history of it. So it's easy for us to say, well, I don't want socialism, but then also dismiss what the Bible so clearly says about what we should be doing to care for the poor as believers in Jesus. Listen to just a, a few verses. I, I selected, I think, seven or eight about what the Bible says about taking care of the poor. Here's a few. James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Galatians 2.10. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager, eager to do. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus said to them, if you would be perfect, I, I want to be perfect, all right, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Matthew 5, 42, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Luke 12, 33, sell your possessions, Give to the needy, provide for yourselves money bags that do not grow old with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Luke 6:38, give, give, be a giver and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with a measure you use, it will be measured back to you. James 2, 5, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. 1 John three seventeen. but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, to be fair, in the New Testament, most of the admonitions to take care of the poor are rooted in Christians taking care of other poor Christians who are in a time of distress. But it is so easy to rationalize and explain away what I think is just quite literal, that we need to be givers, that we need to look for opportunity to give to people who can't pay you back, to the crippled, the, li the lame, the blind, the poor. I love that we support as a church ministries to do that. This past Monday, our entire staff team went out to serve different ministries in our community. We do that once a year. And uh, I got to stop by one of the great partners that we have, one of many. Uh, this one particularly is the Table at Delk, which is an incredible ministry that deals with human trafficking and, you know, speaks life into these men and women who are so trapped in a lot of sinful and, and deceptive behaviors. And it's just interesting that in their heart for the poor, their heart for the marginalized, they, they see God do amazing things just through the smallest acts of kindness. In fact, little things like she said, when we serve our clients, we always do it using a metal utensil, a fork because they don't want a spork. Now I'm thinking the spork is an amazing invention. It's not, I mean, spoon, fork together, poof, amazing. That's an amazing invention. But the, the point of this is this, that, that we want you to see that you're a person of value in the eyes of God. We're not gonna give you the cheap stuff. We're gonna give you our best. I love that they do that. I, I wonder if that's how we treat people in our life who are poor, people who we come across with. And we say, well, I don't want to give to that person. I don't know what they're going to do with the money. You don't know what they're going to do with the money. But you know what? You're not accountable for what they do with the money. You're just accountable for what you do with your money. 
And Jesus says the most amazing thing here at the end of verse 14. The reason I say the question is, what have I sent ahead? Is because he says, when we live like this, when we invite these people in our life, when we minister like the hands and feet of Jesus to people who need it, who can't pay you back, here's what happens. He says at the end, you will be repaid at the resurrection. Think about that. (laughs) That in some way, the way you spend your money now will have some effect in eternity. Not that you earn your way to heaven through how much money you give, you don't. Not that you can pay for someone else to go in eternity, you can't. But there will be some kind of a reckoning for what you do right now with your finances, with your wallet, with your heart. When I thought about this text, I thought about this great scene from Schindler's List, amazing movie, almost 30 years old now. Isn't that hard to believe? If you've seen Schindler's List, you know the premise, Oscar Schindler owned a factory and he protected Jews who were being murdered in the Holocaust, Polish Jews. And the movie's all about how he covered for them and paid for them and provided safety for them. And there's this just heart-wrenching scene at the end where Oscar Schindler is about to have to leave because of his own safety is now in in jeopardy. And he's standing there with about a thousand or so Jews in front of him, those that he had protected. And they gave him a a gold ring that they had gotten for him. And, And you would think he would be grateful, but he begins to break down in tears as he looks at this car and he says, this car was worth 10 lives. Or he takes off his pen that was on his lapel and he says, this this could have been used for two lives. And he he begins to cry, he begins to to weep, and he's just saying, you know, I could have done more, I could have done more. Now, now don't miss the point of this text or that illustration. You, You cannot buy people's way into heaven. You cannot earn your way to heaven by how much you give. But I promise you this, even as followers of Jesus, one day we'll be in eternity, and we will have to give an reckoning and stand account for what we did with our finances in this life. And what will be shown to us is that we spent so much time and energy saving up money to buy stuff we don't need to impress people that really don't matter. But Jesus says, invite the poor, invite the lame, invite the crippled, invite the blind, and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I don't know what God wants to do with this text in your life today, but I think back just to the beginning of it all, that God looked at me, he looked at you as a sinner, someone who was poor in their sin. I don't care what your bank account says, you are poor in your sin. And John 3, 16 says that God so loved you that he gave. And it says that he so loved you that he gave of himself, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He he gave to you and that if you would believe in him, the word believe is, is the word trust. It's to, it's to not just agree, yes, there was a guy named Jesus 2,000 years ago, but it's literally to put, to put your life into the hands of Jesus and Jesus alone. He says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you would put your life into his hands and build your life on him, that you would not be destroyed You would not be separated from God. You wouldn't go to hell. This is what we deserve because of our sin. But through what Jesus did on the cross and what he did in the resurrection for you, you might have life, eternal life. That's the gospel and that's the good news. So we get to live every day looking for opportunities to demonstrate the love of Jesus to people whom God loves. That's what we want to build our life on today. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you today. And if God's stirring your heart, stop by a tent. 
God's stirring your heart today. If you're online, click that link. Let us connect with you and walk with you so you might be the follower Jesus wants you to be. Let's build our life on him. Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news. God, we thank you for the fact that you loved us. And God, we thank you that this week we're gonna get opportunities to love others in your name. God, you do whatever you need in this message through your spirit. God, convict, inspire, move, change. And God, may we be more like you. Help us build our life on you. And we'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen.